And now, a passage from San Antonio de Bexar, historical, traditional, legendary, an epitome of early Texas history. From Chapter 10, The Republic of Texas. After the fall of the Alamo, San Antonio did not long remain in the hand of the Mexicans. Events followed each other thick and fast until the consummation of the revolutionists' determination came at victorious San Jacinto with its battle cry, Remember the Alamo! Remember Goliad! The Republic of Texas was formed, and Spanish and Mexican dominion being ended in this country, San Antonio ceased to be the capital of a foreign government. But according to the Constitution of 1836, the precincts, or municipalities then existing being reorganized as the first or original counties of the new republic, the county of Bexar was created, along with 22 others on March 17, 1836, and San Antonio made its capital. The campaign for the office of first president of the new republic was so filled with acrimony that two of the candidates for election, too proud and sensitive to bear the vilifications against them, committed suicide. As a result of the campaign, but little life appeared in San Antonio until the opening of the general land office of the republic at that place on January 4, 1838. This was immediately followed by land claimants with surveying parties, holders of bounty warrants and headright certificates, as well as many others seeking employment or adventure. The surveyors and locators desiring to select the best lands often went beyond the settlements to begin operations. The Indians, seeing them at work, were not slow to believe what the Mexicans had told them, that the white people would take all their hunting grounds and drive them off. The attacks on the frontier were in resistance to this movement. Among those appearing in San Antonio at this time, seeking employment as a surveyor, was a young man destined to perform a most important and meritorious service in defense of the Texas frontier and to gain much renown as a fearless border chief and partisan leader, soon to be known officially as Captain Jack Hayes. San Antonio itself, although the most populous and important town in the Republic of Texas, was still the extreme and isolated outpost of civilization. Being greatly exposed to Indian forays, it continued headquarters for the defenders of the frontier. But in spite of Indian depredations, an avenue of trade was soon opened up between San Antonio and Mexico, thus making an approach to the peaceful arts. Early in 1840, a third attempt was made to treat with the Comanches. This tribe having declared their wish to make peace with the whites, it was agreed that the chiefs would meet in San Antonio to sign the treaty and deliver all their white prisoners. The courthouse was situated at the corner of Market Street and Main Plaza, beyond which was a small jail and a large corral, in which, as a rule, the sheriff, soldiers, and rangers penned their horses. The Indian warriors met in conference with the civil and military authorities in the courthouse. Upon their arrival, it was found that they had but one prisoner, Matilda Lockhart. The Texans, knowing there were other prisoners, insisted that part of the band go back for the rest of the captives, leaving half a dozen of their chiefs as hostages until their return. They emphasized their wishes by ordering up Major Howard, captain of infantry of the Texas Army, who, with a band of about 20 soldiers, soon entered the council room and cut off the retreat of the Indians from the rear. There was much excitement during which it was discovered that one of the Indian chiefs had a fixed bow and arrow concealed under his blanket. It was taken away, and the Indian fired upon by the soldiers, which was followed by a general attack upon the Indians, who, sounding their deafening war whoop, fled closely pursued by soldiers and civilians. Several hand-to-hand -hand encounters occurred. Some of the Indians took refuge in stone houses and closed the doors, but not one of them escaped, the whole 65 being either killed or taken prisoners. This battle, known as the Council House Fight, took place on El Dia de San Jose, St. Joseph's Day, March 18th. The next day, the commanding officer went to the camp of the squaws back of the market house and informed them of the death of the Indians, proposing that one of them carry the news to the tribe and bring back the remainder of the white captives. A middle-aged squaw volunteered, and going to the corral was allowed to select a good mount. A few days later, the Indians came to the edge of the city and sent a notice that they were there with the captives. Remembering the fate of their brethren, they refused to come into town. An exchange was made, and the treaty signed at San Pedro Springs. 
In 1841, President Lamar, with a considerable suite, visited San Antonio. A grand ball was given him in Mrs. Uturi's long room, the room being decorated with flags and evergreens, flowers not being much cultivated at that time. General Lamar and Mrs. Juan N. Seguin, wife of the mayor, opened the ball with a waltz. It was during Lamar's administration that a law was passed giving each county nearly 15,000 acres of land to be used in establishing public free schools. Early in 1842, San Antonio was again invested by a Mexican army. That country, desiring to keep up such hostilities as might give color to the assertion that war between Texas and Mexico was not ended, thus preventing the former from becoming annexed to the United States. This army, consisting of about 700 men under Colonel Rafael Vasquez, took possession of the place and reorganized it as a Mexican town. Upon his appearance, there occurred the runaway of 1842, when many of the American women of San Antonio were escorted by the men of their families out of the city as far as the Guadalupe, after having burned many of their valuables and turned over furniture and other possessions to Mexican friends. Colonel Vasquez and his men remained but two days in the city, however, and conducted themselves officially with much decorum. Later in 1842, a report came into San Antonio that a band of robbers from Mexico was coming to loot the city. The citizens met together and organized two companies, one under Captain Manchaca with quarters in the old courthouse, while the other under Chauncey Johnson, an American, had quarters on the corner of Soledad and Main Plaza. As soon as this organization was effected, three Mexicans were sent with an escort to meet the band. It proved to be the regular Army of Mexico, 1,200 strong under General Adrian Wall, who kept the three men prisoners. The firing of a gun just before daybreak, not long after, and the sound of the music of the dancing tune La Cachucha proved a warning to its citizens that the Mexican forces had entered San Antonio. Manchaca's company, deciding that they could not withstand a whole army, disbanded, but Johnson's men determined to stand together and fight it out. Upon firing a volley into the band, which killed 15 or 20 of the musicians, they so incensed General Wall that he placed a small cannon where the Southern Hotel stands today and fired into the men. Johnson raised the white flag after which his company, consisting of 40 men, were all taken prisoners and later sent to Mexico. While the district court of Bexar County was in session, General Wall captured the entire bar of lawyers together with a few citizens, 53 in number, holding these prisoners of war, among them being Judge Hutchinson presiding and Samuel A. Maverick, a young lawyer and one of San Antonio's distinguished citizens, the latter having escorted his family as far as LaGrange during the historic runaway, had then made a trip to Alabama and just returned to San Antonio to attend the fall term of court. While in triumphant possession of the city, General Wool was given a fine ball by sympathizing Mexican citizens. After the ball, a report came that Colonel Jack Hayes was camped on the Salado, a creek six miles from town, preparing to attack Wall. The latter left with a portion of his army to meet the Texans, and a battle took place which lasted a day and night, but Hayes could not be dislodged. By daylight, the enemy had retreated toward the Rio Grande. During the Battle of the Salado, Wall sent a company of cavalry to attack Dawson's men, who were coming from Seguin to reinforce Hayes. A massacre ensued in which most of the Americans were killed, some of them being cut down after having surrendered. After the Battle of Salado, the Texas forces again reoccupied San Antonio, but too late to rescue the prisoners, largely on account of the jealousy of the commanding officers of the Texas forces, Moore, Moorhead, and Caldwell. Captain Matthew Caldwell was the hero of the Salado, for it was he who, with a force of 250 men, had withstood the attack on two sides by Wool's entire force, but Moore was the ranking officer. Each division wanted its own commander to lead, leaving Hayes, who had already captured the Mexican artillery, to maintain himself unsupported. The troops returned in small squads, much disgusted to San Antonio, while getting off in safety, his prisoners already far on their way. John Tuig, one of the Irish settlers of San Antonio, was among these prisoners, all of whom were incarcerated in the famous, or infamous, Castle of Perot in Mexico. He made a sensational escape from prison and rode boldly in a carriage through the streets of the city of Mexico. 
When he learned that the Mexican army was marching on San Antonio, knowing his store would be looted by them, he invited all the poor of the population to come and help themselves, after which he set fire to the building. Other captives were James L. Trueheart, county attorney, and P. L. Bucor, later mayor of San Antonio. Samuel Maverick was liberated on March 30, 1843, through the good offices of General Waddy Thompson, a connection of his then United States minister to Mexico. The remainder of the prisoners were not released by Santa Ana until June 16 of the same year. Even after Hayes reoccupied San Antonio, the fugitive citizens of that place continued their flight, first to Gonzales and afterwards to LaGrange. In 1845, Texas became one of the United States of America, the only state to be annexed and not admitted into the Union. This, too, under terms of her own dictation, among others, that of retaining her eminent domain. Texas is also the only one of our United States which has contracted treaties with foreign nations, among them a treaty of commerce and navigation between the Republic of Texas and the Netherlands, a similar one with Great Britain under Victoria, Regina, one of political and commercial relations with France under Louis Philippe, and a boundary treaty with the United States under Martin Van Buren, President. If you enjoy the content being produced here on High Americana, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon, which is linked below in the description. Thank you very much.